Hello everybody. Last time we talked at length about the theoretical framework and political reality behind the People's Republic of China. I was accused of being unbalanced and scared of controversy because all things I talked about were at least 30 years ago. So in this video we will see how China is developing right now, what its domestic policies are like and how it is slowly taking over the job of the global hegemon from the Americans. And yeah, I'm gonna talk about the Uyghurs. I'm not scared of criticizing China. The story of modern China begins when Xi Jinping takes power. He was elected leader of the Communist Party and of the military in 2012 and he was elected president of China in 2013. I say elected, but as most of you know from the last video, it's more of a selection than an election. In 2018, the parliament almost unanimously scrapped term limits, so he may be in charge for a long time to come. His presidency brought many changes with it. For one, he said that China must learn more about the world and that the world must learn more about China. This signals an end to the semi-isolationist stance China used for the past decades. Under Deng Xiaoping, the motto of China was lay low and hide your strength. This is over now. China is using its enormous economic power to shape the globe. There could be many reasons for that. Maybe they want economic growth, maybe they want to spread socialist ideas, and maybe they want to be neo-colonialist and subjugate everyone else. As I explained last time, these things can look the same, which makes it hard to judge them. But more about the global politics in a bit. For now, let's look at domestic politics. First, the one-child policy, which was enacted under Deng Xiaoping. So, essentially what happened was that there was a demographic transformation in the 50s through 70s. At the start of that transformation, China had little medical infrastructure and doctors, so the child mortality was high. In response to this, the birth rate was high, because people knew only a small part of their children would survive. Then, because of the socialist takeover, medicine improved a lot, so child mortality was very low. But people still had lots of children, because that's what they were used to. So the population went up by a lot. Experience shows that if they had done nothing, the population growth would have stopped in a generation or two. This demographic transition, as it's called, happened in every country that industrialized. In the UK, this was during Victorian times. In Germany, it was before World War II. And in the US, it was after World War II. There was a baby boom, which is why those children were called boomers. And right now, a lot of African nations are in the middle of this change. So if you hear someone talk about Africans outbreeding Europeans, then you now know that that's BS, because these nations will soon transition towards the latter end of the transformation and their birth rates will match ours. There goes the theory of white genocide, destroyed by demographic facts and historical precedent. Deng Xiaoping didn't want to wait two generations for the birth rates to reduce, because the sheer amount of people was beginning to look like a problem. There were great fears of overpopulation and the, that they wouldn't be able to grow enough food and build enough housing. Of course, overpopulation isn't actually a thing, but they were worried. So they enacted a one-child policy, meaning every couple could only have one child. This was enforced in many ways, none of them good large fines, allegedly also forced sterilization and forced abortions. Not good, bad China. Also because of sex selective abortions, China has thousands more men than women, which means there will be a load of incels in the near future. Unless they're all gay, in which case it's all good. If you now think that the one child policy was awful and shouldn't have existed, then you will be excited to hear that in 2015, Xi Jinping abolished the one-child policy and replaced it with a two-child policy. Incremental improvements. China will suffer a lot under the effects of the one-child policy. As the boom children from the 60s are reaching their retirement age, there aren't enough young people who can take over running the economy. It's called a one 2 four problem. It refers to the fact that every young adult has to carry the cost of two parents and four grandparents. Of course, not directly, the state pays them, but it has to finance the retirement of six people with the taxes from one person. So that's going to be a big challenge in the near future. One of Xi's greatest promises was to eradicate the corruption, 
which plagued the People's Republic of China. If you remember, the state is nothing but party officials selecting each other for higher positions. Naturally, there can be loads of corruption in that. So Xi took it upon himself to do something about it. Within the first years of his presidency, he tried former members of the Politburo and previous governments. His administration formed the centrally dispatched inspection teams, which, as the name implies, are teams sent from the central government to inspect. Specifically, they inspect the local governments and search for corruption among the lower levels of the Chinese state. Within two years, 200,000 low-ranking officials were punished by these teams. Naturally, she is accused of just purging his political opponents, which there is little evidence of. The Chinese courts are independent, so the president has no influence on who is charged or declared guilty. Let's now move on to the thing that will get this video the most hate. The Uyghurs. In China, especially the western regions, there is a total of 12 million of them. They are Muslim and ethnically and culturally different from the Han Chinese, who make up most of China. Recently, they were all categorized by the central government as either normal, safe or unsafe. You don't want to be classified as unsafe. The way they arrived at these classifications feels kind of arbitrary and potentially violating human rights. For example, a reason to be unsafe is to own a prayer rug or grow a beard. As we know, people who believe in God and have beards are all potential terrorists, uh, apparently. Naturally, this goes against religious freedom. These people are then seen as a threat to public safety and as enemies of the socialist revolution. Note that they considered all Uyghurs a potential danger, unless they could demonstrate otherwise. Kind of like at the airport, where everyone is seen as a potential terrorist until proven otherwise, instead of the innocent until proven guilty, which we see in our justice systems. And what did China do with the people they consider the danger? Put them in camps. There are re-education camps for unsafe individuals. Most of them release the detainees overnight though, which makes them sound more like a school than a camp, but whatever. In these schools, in accordance with what we talked about last time, there is hard work and political education. The goal is officially to make sure they become safe citizens and are not a danger to anyone. As I said last time, I oppose prison labor because it's pretty much slavery. There are accusations of abuse by the guards in these camps and there are accusations that China doesn't care about whether these are dangerous individuals and is instead locking them up simply because they're Uyghurs and China wants to erase their culture. There are many people saying that, but it's impossible to judge with the information I'm given. So the best I can do is say that the Chinese government insists that these camps are only for people who are dangerous and that people who only have second-hand knowledge, like American government, say it's a racial thing, and some even say it's a genocide. Which, by definition, could be true. Genocide can mean erasing a culture by re-education instead of killing. If China is actually putting people in camps for no other reason than that they're Uyghurs, that would be, by definition, a genocide. And I oppose genocide. But then again, from my position, it's impossible to judge what the intentions and effects of any of this are. I can't pretend to understand the nuance of the situation with what I know from the other end of the continent. Let's talk about the social credit system. There is a lot of inaccurate information about it online. Essentially, every Chinese citizen will get a social credit score. Good things like donating blood increases the score, while bad things like reserving a seat at the restaurant and not showing up reduce the score. I saw a YouTube video which tried to compare that to gamification, making a high score game out of being an obedient citizen to make people compete for being as compliant as possible. And I heard people say it's a dystopian system to have because small things can be punished. Black Mirror has an episode in which people rate each other on their phones and people who don't know better think that's what the social credit system is for. Of course, it's not some dystopian tool for control or some manipulative tactic. Matter of fact, the USA has a system which has the same purpose, the credit rating system. The entire purpose of the social credit system is to determine whether people are financially able to pay back a loan. That's it. Having a low score doesn't get you into a camp or ostracized by your friends and family. It gets you blocked from taking a loan and that's it. 
Sure, it's a bit odd to take minor things like smoking and donating blood to influence this value, but it's practically no different to credit rating systems in other countries. Also, the system isn't even in use in all of China, and they're still working out different methods of calculating the scores and so on. As we saw last time, China is currently experiencing an economic miracle. The GDP keeps going up and up and it's not showing any signs of stopping. As I explained last time, this is in part due to the state-run economy and in part due to the special economic zones. But there is another reason. State financed building projects. China spends 5.5% of its GDP on construction. Relatively speaking, that's 80% more than what the US is spending on its military. We're talking about huge amounts of money here. And where does this money go? Well, the state gives a contract to private or government-run construction businesses. They build roads, housing, dams and so on, and they get paid a lot in return. That pay is then partially given to the workers in the form of raises, which gives the workers more money, which they then spend on other products in the economy, increasing their GDP and the quality of life of the citizens. And that's the reason so much money is spent on construction. It boosts the GDP on paper. And yeah, Xi Jinping really wants the GDP to continue growing. The side effect is that China is filled with empty houses and unused highways. There are over 50 million empty houses in China right now. That's the population of England worth of empty homes. You may be wondering how China can afford to spend so much money on infrastructure. Where's the money coming from? From the economy. China is in large part a state enterprise. And the main difference between a state enterprise and a capitalist business is where the money ends up. In capitalism, all profit is put into the private bank account of the bosses and stock owners. While in a state enterprise, all that profit goes to the state, which is then mostly used on the citizens again. All the money that in capitalism is only used to make a rich guy even richer is used for the common good in a state enterprise. Not that while I consider state enterprise to be better than a capitalist system, I still have problems with that one. It's better, not perfect. But this is also why I dislike the term state capitalism, because it assumes that the state using the money on the people and a capitalist trying to reach a new high score with their wealth are the same thing. That was China's domestic policies. Let's now see how China is doing on the global state. In 2013, China unveiled its plan to reshape the entire global economy. The plan was called the Belt and Road Initiative, formerly called One Belt, One Road. The plan is enormous. It will encompass 70 countries and 4 to 8 trillion US dollars. It started in 2013 and it should be finished by the 100th anniversary of the proclamation of the People's Republic of China in 2049. The idea behind the plan is to work closer with other countries so China can get more international influence. The Chinese government is paying for most of the plan. The goals are to create infrastructure which makes it easier for China to trade with the lucrative markets in Europe. A thousand years ago there was the so-called Silk Road through which the Middle East and China traded. This plan is supposed to be a continuation of that both via an overland route using trains and highways through all of Asia and a sea route which goes from the South China Sea to the Mediterranean. One reason China is doing that is because they want to keep the economy growing, just like with the other construction projects. They're using the money they have to pay businesses to do construction jobs, this time in another country. So the GDP growth is nice and high, with the side effect that this makes trade easier, which helps grow the GDP even more. Countries which aren't part of the plan, like the USA and Japan, see this plan as a way for China to undermine the USA as global superpower. To be fair, this may be true. China is helping all these countries develop their transportation industry, while the US is busy bombing civilians in Iraq. Of course, China looks better when you compare them. The plan is absolutely massive, encompassing 60% of the world's population and almost all markets in Europe and Asia. They even suggested forming a united economic area with many of these countries. Those are the ones in blue. If this happened, it would be like a super EU and the largest single market on earth. In total, there are three proposed overland belts. 
The North Belt would go through Central Asia and Russia to Europe. The Central Belt would pass through Central Asia and West Asia to Persia, Turkey and the Mediterranean. And the South Belt would go from China through Southeast Asia and South Asia onto the Indian Ocean. There's also a belt going to the coast in Pakistan and one connecting Mongolia and Russia. But these are small and do not count as belts. There is also the Mediterranean Silk Road. Correction, it's called the Maritime Silk Road, not the Mediterranean Silk Road. Which is a network of ports which China has to pay little to no fees for using to get to the Mediterranean to trade with Europe. These ports are typically funded and run by Chinese businesses, the Chinese government or governments which have treaties with China. The Belt and Road Initiative has been called imperialist and neo-colonialist by Western countries that don't take part in the plan. China is accused of predatory lending and deliberately bankrupting smaller nations just to later pay off their debt and make them subservient to China. A commonly cited example is Sri Lanka, which had big trouble paying its debt, so they leased the Hambotana port to China to get the cash they needed to pay back their debt. And while this example makes it seem like China is trying to exploit other countries, the investigation of the Sri Lankan government didn't find China to be at fault for the debt. And also the port was leased to a Chinese company, not to China the country. There are multiple examples which try to prove that China is deliberately bankrupting countries, but on closer inspection, none of these bankruptcies were caused by China, even though they were convenient for Chinese interests. The main effect of the Belt and Road Initiative is to center the global economy around China. Right now, the two largest trade agreements are the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, both led by the USA. The Belt and Road Initiative is larger and more comprehensive than those two. This can cause economic growth for every country in the plan, especially China, who stands to gain easy shipping to Europe, allowing for great economic expansion. So now we have to ask ourselves yet again, what is China planning on doing? Do they want to make Chinese capitalists and businesses larger and more powerful just to make more money and get a higher GDP? Or are they secretly determined to dominate the global economy and then reach socialism? It's up to you. It's impossible for me to find a fact-based answer. We know that China is trying to take over the global economy. And the idea of a foreign superpower taking over my country is scary. But the idea of a genuine socialist nation liberating the workers here is great. It's just that both of those look the same, which is unsettling. So yeah, China is taking over the globe. Let's hope they have good intentions. Thanks for watching everybody, and thanks to my patrons for allowing me to have no ads on my videos. I started treatment for my eating disorder this week, so I had to pay for that. I mean, thanks for making that possible. This way I will presumably not die in the near future, which is neat. Seriously though, I'm deeply thankful for all the support I get here and on Patreon. And I would especially like to thank Comrade Asshole, Darius the Bird, Eric Betts, Noah, Alki, Attila Nimetz, Bryn Flores, Chairman Pineapple, Carmat Chuk, Daniel Hyman, Dr. Grimm, Emily Marigold Klassen, Gabby Gita, Hugo Castellos, Hurdington Gurdington, Joshua Clark, Klaus Strupp, Marcia Rojek, Nene Epema, Neil Bandere, Nicholas Wiggins, Nora Quinn, Pote, Ramin Deville, Sean Murphy, Stairmaster Chef, Stephen and Trey.